Hi, welcome to my Fast AI Lesson 2 recap. I'm recording this for myself and anyone else going through the Fast AI Deep Learning for Coders uh, lessons on YouTube. Um, super happy with the course. Um, I'm moving to Lesson 3 right now, but wanted to cap off Lesson 2 before I forget any of the things that I experienced through it. Um, I do agree that there is no better way to make sure that you understand something by teaching it as recommended on this lesson. Uh, so what did I decide to do for lesson two for the homework? I, at first, I thought I was going to do something very aggressive. I wanted to create a flight simulator AI co-pilot, a um, bit of an aggressive goal. Uh, I grabbed some data, visual data, threw that into chat GPT, uh, GPTV, snapshot of the cockpit, something like you see on, on the left side here. Uh, and it, it was, it was too aggressive. Um, you can actually see it. There are some interesting results though. Uh, I was passing in tabular data from the Microsoft flight simulator API to see if it could analyze it. And, uh, actually it did, uh, for, for example, this was, this was a flight. Uh, where I believe I was descending uh, towards an airport. And this is just tabular data, altitude, heading, um, throttle setting. Uh, and ChatGPT, GPT-4 was capable of actually determining that I was uh, descending uh, from like the very beginning of a descent into, uh, into approach, which was really cool. Um, but definitely realized that that was gonna derail me from finishing the lessons. Uh, so I scaled back and I thought about what could I do as a good objective that I could do for lesson two. And I came up with just, okay, let's focus on one thing. Uh, Cessna 152 speedometer rating, right? So this little dial on the, um, if you're not familiar with aircraft, this is kind of the speedometer for the aircraft. Um, and here's one example of what that looks like. So. I looked around for a data set, so starting with objective, okay, objective defined. Um, the data sets didn't really exist, so I had to create my own. And I don't have a Cessna 152, but I have Flight Simulator. So I went out and screenshotted like crazy, and I came up with about 140 uh, images, um, which when actually you look at it per bucket is pretty bad. Um, some of these I didn't have that many, like two for this, um, you know, but a handful for some of these buckets. And I was very worried that it just wasn't going to work, that I was going to uh, fail at uh, this challenge I had given myself. But as Jeremy recommended, try. Don't bother trying to overclean or, you know, your data or try a whole bunch of weird algorithms on it, just try it. So that's what I did. So I took this limited data set and threw this into, let's big in the uh, notebook here, uh, took a very simplified version of the code from the, is it a bird or not uh, workbook and the uh, bear classifier. Uh, so I stole a little bit from lesson three for that. Um, but yeah, here it is. Here's my training notebook. So prepping the data. This is this is akin to the drawing the circles on the owl, you know. Um, if you don't know the joke, it's the draw an owl. It's gonna be a lesson three, so I think so you'll you'll get it at some point. So anyway, we do the imports. I set my path for my data set, uh, which has all of those images that I just showed you on Kaggle, uh, is in the parent directory speed data set. As you can see here, it's the same exact thing. I have speedometer pictures in there. And then create my data block. I still don't fully understand how the data block API compares to data loaders. I understand that I'm creating some way to represent the training and validation data uh, from the data set of images that I am providing. I uh, didn't really mess with 
too much other than the augmentations. I, since I had such a limited amount of data, the augmentations actually really helped. When I first created the data set, I probably had like two or three spe speed readings per, per two or three images per speed, which was not enough. So I leaned really hard on the augmentations to, to help out and they did. Uh, actually, it worked reasonably well uh, and I thought it was worse than it was and I'll get to that in a second. So the only one I don't do here is I don't do flips. Uh, I think that the classifiers are learning the numbers on the speedometer. If you look at, you know, say here, right, I think it's actually learning the numbers on it. And if you flip it, then it kind of ruins that ability. So I took that out and that seemed to really uh, help a lot. Um, the multiplier I set down a little to avoid like really twist, you know, whatever twists and pulls it does on the images to kind of create uh, those augmentations of it. I didn't want it too crazy. Um, maybe the better, maybe a good idea. Is that an out of domain or a, is that an out of domain issue where like, you know, if someone has a camera, has a wide angle camera and the speedometer is all the way stretched on the edge of the video or the image that could cause issues. So, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, let's run this. So we're going to go split our data set, create batches. Cool. And there we go. So bunch of speed readings labeled. Uh, this is actually me playing around with other models. So I did this after I did. I, I listened, listened to Jeremy on this one and just ran ResNet 18 uh, all the way through until today when I was trying these. And honestly, I get such unreliable results right now that it, I can't even tell if it's making a difference. So definitely leave the model selection for later. Um, because there's a lot of them and you can play with them all day. Really, the only thing that made sense for me was playing around with getting the right size of the model because I'm running this locally. And you can see that my memory usage on my GPU, this gold line is pretty high. So, because uh, Flight Simulator is running in the background right now. Uh, so I use the Pico, which really is the smallest. Comment. Let's see if it'll run and not run out of memory. So we can see. Oh, we're real close. <laughs> what is that? 7.82 gigs out of 8 gigs. But we're going to make it. So I'm actually training as a 3070 Ti, training at the same time as running Flight Simulator in the background. Um, the loss, uh, I'm sorry, the error rate, I think I optimally after like 50 to 70 epochs was getting around like 0.3, which was not too bad, but it's actually not as bad as I thought it was because uh, you have to analyze, you have to look at what are your, what type of error are you getting? And for me, the most useful thing by far was the confusion matrix. Like once I got this, I was like, oh, Ah, okay. So here's the confusion matrix right now. Um, it's pretty confused because we ran it on like 10 epochs. Um, as I'm talking, I'll run this on a, like 50. Hopefully it doesn't, don't run out of memory, please. Um, so the confusion matrix shows you predicted versus actual. And what you wanna see is diagonal here when the predicted matches the actual. And what I was getting was at first my error was relatively high uh, when I was using ResNet 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was disheartening. I went to the, I went to the Discord and was like, guys, this, this is even like a, a problem that's solvable with these analog gauges. And um, one of the, I think it was Xander, Xander Mackey? Sorry if I'm completely butchering your name on, on Discord. Was like, no, no, it should be a, feasible problem. 
um, you know, do you have enough data? So I went on, screenshot out a bunch more uh, speedometer readings and tried again. And uh, not only did my error rate start to go down to a pretty reasonable, like, you know, I think I saw 0 0.3, 0.35-ish. Um, when I used the confusion matrix, I was able to actually tell uh, how bad the errors were because I have sequential classes. And this is something that I sure that I'll come back to is that I've, I've bucketed these classes. They're not ordered. They're just separate classes. But there's probably a way to do, instead of a classification, some type of just output a scalar, right? So like the speed, the detected speed. Um, and so that's just a continuous uh, variable. I think that's the right word. Um, so I'm still pretty limited in my understanding of that. So right now, got a 0.64, it's not great. Let's look at the confusion matrix. But you can see that it's it's starting to get this diagonal here, which is a good sign. That means that it, the errors are off by like one or two buckets, right? So like five or 10 knots off which probably for a real flight thing would probably be totally unacceptable. But for flight simulator and learning, I think uh, it, it's decent. And if I run it for more epochs, and honestly, if I think if I go back to ResNet 18, I think it worked better. Um, so again, yeah, don't don't overplay with funny models and architectures and whatever's trendy or you know whatever you saw in some post on Google whatever you saw in some YouTube video, like, hey, this is the newest, greatest, uh, you know, research paper on classification. Sometimes not for your data. Uh, and Jeremy went over that a lot. And, you know, definitely, definitely verified. Um, plot top loss is also super, super, super helpful. This is where you can see where you have your most confident mistakes um, because it's going to tell you the prediction, the actual, so predicted 90 was actually 95 the loss and the probability so the probability is the most relevant one for humans here i believe so this one was very very confident that it was 90 but it's, it's yeah it's pretty clearly 95 knots so that that's indicative of uh, you know it's it's very confidently wrong and that's really what you are worried about uh, so uh, this would be something to, to watch and you know if I run more epochs and I get more training data and you know add more variety to my training data it's probably where I'm gonna be able to get this my you know error down uh, get this diagonal a little bit cleaner um, but it would take more than more than 50 epochs and probably going back to ResNet models honestly um, cool so I have my model and then we export it so that we can use it in the next phase. So the next phase was getting a Gradio app uh, running for uh, your classifier. So that's what I did. So now we have our speed, our pickled speed file over on the left here. And we'll go ahead and close this notebook so it doesn't take up memory. Uh, so just make sure reset that and you can see and this is NV top by the way if this if you're not familiar it's a command line utility that tracks your it's like a it's like top or H top right for your GPU so processes and memory and uh, compute usage uh, and this little encoding things for video so that's because running OBS right now to you know capture the, my screen uh, all right, cool. Let's take that off there. Let's go to the inference notebook. So this one, I made a previous video on the fixes required to make this work. Uh, so you can either check that out or I'll just give you a super fast recap here. If you use the current state of the notebook uh, for uh, the examples for the great, the Gradio uh, example, on lesson two, 
you're going to wind up with an error. Uh, you need to specify, and that's because the fast API and well, no, it's NB Dev has gotten updated, uh, and NB Dev has new usage characteristics. So you need to have this once at the top of your notebook. This default, this hash pipe default underscore exp app. Uh, that tells it what the name of your application is, so you can export your Python file from your notebook, which is what the whole point of that is, right, of the export, is that you're gonna create this Py file from your notebook, so you can put that in uh, on your Gradio hugging face space. Uh, so you need that, you need these hash byte export on any of the cells that you want to export, and then you need this specific format of mbdev. This is different than the radio hugging face example currently in the lessons. Um, I have a gist that I'll post on this, uh, so you can just copy this code. But basically, you're just saying, "Hey, mbdev, export this notebook app.ipymb to this directory, uh, which is just the current directory." But anyway. Uh, so let's run through this. So run that, import fastai and radio. Is our memory going to blow up? No, I don't think so. Finish? Yeah, it's finished. Grab an image. Load our pickled model file. Go ahead and predict, and it's going to say 85, which is close. Uh, and then obviously this is the probabilities of all the classes. This tripped me up. I had to peek ahead to lesson three to know that it was the vocab I had to pay attention to. The order of the classes was not numeric, so. Uh, I thought that these were ordered by number, but they're actually being ordered, I believe this is just alphanumerically, and that caused problems because I thought it was a different order. So you have to make your categories match what the actual uh, vocab is. And so I did that. So then I just, what I did is I just literally just copied and pasted this output into this categories variable. And this is just pulled from the lesson dictionary of the zipped categories and the probabilities and then let's run this so we've we've uh, de defined our classify image function we'll run it you can see it's outputting probabilities and for each of these classes and then we'll run the gradio local so you can see we have our example images. <laughs> Not doing so great at the moment. Um, again, with uh, only 50 epochs. Let's see, 80 is coming out as 85. 45 is coming out as 45. So not too bad. Um, definitely not the best model I've trained on this data set. So uh, I've had much better results, but this is what I got on this live demonstration. So I'll live with it for now. Um, and then, and then the export, of course. So, you know, the export will output our app.py. That's what we're actually going to push to hugging face spaces uh, to run with radio. And I do have a space uh, hosted right now with the better trained version uh, that I had. And then what I can do is go to, let's see. Stop these guys today, stop using RAM. Okay, then let's do a live demonstration, I guess if Flight Simulator doesn't decide to destroy my video. It's getting real choppy. Let's
if it's Flight Simulator or if it's uh, Chrome. Let's see. print screen this. Get the speedometer. Cool. And then open our just bear with me a second. All right, this is PHDH, if anyone's wondering. Um, Dillingham Airport in um, North Shore of Oahu. It's a really cool spot. Um, <laughs> why is everything, why is it running at three FPS? And it looks like a zero. Let's see what it does. Any second now. Aha! Uh -huh. And then <laughs> kind of worked. Um, apologize for, I don't know what's going on. With, oh, now it's back to 60 FPS. Great. Um, so there you go. Uh, the setup of a very limited, uh, but simple, uh, classification system for a problem that, you know, I, it was interesting to me. I, I definitely recommend finding something that you really care about, uh, and making a small enough problem to actually get through the lesson. And, uh, and going from there. Um, if you have any questions, uh, either drop them in the YouTube comments or come over to the Fast AI uh, Discord. Um, that's where I'm hanging out and asking questions myself. Anyways, uh, hopefully I will be able to expand more uh, on the uh, co-pilot topic, we'll see. That's kind of my long-term goal is to build something more than just a, you know, speedometer reader. Um, maybe something more interactive, make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Maybe read a few gauges, take on some of the co-pilot functionality. We'll see. Um, but uh, I'll probably see you on lesson three. And uh, good luck.